And also, when you're young, I mean, you don't know that things can go wrong, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, being you know, now, if I started a business today, I'd be scared to death. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is all about creativity and hustle happening in and around the great state of Montana. This is a fun week. We sit down with Charlie Beaton of The Big Dipper. I mean, this this episode is really just about fun. The Big Dipper, they sell ice cream. Can't think of a, of a product that just does a better job of putting a smile on people's face. And a lot of people. I mean, there's a line around the block pretty much every night of the summer and most nights in the wintertime. And people are lining up in in the snowstorm to get ice cream from the Big Dipper. And uh, it's just awesome to learn more about Charlie's work, his path that he took to get to where he is, the decisions he made along the way. And a couple things in particular I'd like you to pay attention to in this conversation. First, just some parallels between Charlie's path and uh, Matt McQuilkin, the, the guest from last week, the co-founder of Black Coffee. I mean, the two of these guys each put together a set of life experiences that uniquely prepared them for success in their chosen businesses. The second thing I'd like you to pay attention to is Charlie just has a a pretty clear sense of what he wants out of his business, what he wants out of his relationship to his work, what he wants out of family and his personal life. And just that clarity was particularly inspiring. We live in an age where there's just all kinds of pressures to overinvest in our careers and define ourselves in terms of the work we do. In fact, we dug into that with Meg Witcher a couple of weeks ago. And I think Charlie seems to kind of operate uh, outside of all that. He's got a clear sense of uh, what he wants to do with his business, how he wants it to grow, and how he wants his relationship to work to sort of operate in his life. And that was kind of fun to learn about that, um, that clarity of purpose that Charlie has. Anyway, super fun conversation. And um, I'll turn it over to Charlie Beaton. All right, so we're here with Charlie Beaton, owner and founder of Big Dipper Ice Cream. Charlie, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun. So, how did you? So, how did you start this? Like, oh how? man, well, um, so I teach principles of marketing. Okay, it's my primary course. It's survey course that all students here have to take, and um, we we wanted to get all of our core curriculum online, mm-hmm. or at least available online. Yeah, right? and. Uh, you know, I was like, well, if, if that's going to happen to this class, I'm going to be the one to do it. Yeah. And as I was building out the class, I was dragging my heels with the content piece. Mm-hmm. You know, most people do videos. Yeah. But I've been listening to podcasts a lot myself. Yeah. I've been using them. I have more in the last couple of years. Yeah. I drive to Billings a little bit. So I kind of get some excited for my trip because like, all right. Pick yeah. These you just get into and something you think. Yeah. And, and there's so many different ones out yeah. there. And so I've been using them. In the place of readings with the students oh, and sure. getting good results. Yeah. I don't know if it's simply just because they're listening rather than not reading, you know? You know, so I, I wanted to build something that was digestible. It didn't tether students to a screen. Yeah. You know, so many of our students are, are working or sports or whatever. Yeah. And so... And know. they always have their earbuds in yes. all the time. So that's what started the idea. That's a great idea. It started... Um, Built 10 episodes where we like do five or 10 minutes of course content and then a half hour interview with somebody awesome doing yeah. something in that area. And as I was doing these interviews, I thought, shit, this could actually be something for the school. Yeah. So here we are. So I got to say, we, I think you have, you must have the happiest job in Missoula. And Big Dipper, you've been in business 23 years this year. Is that right? I think that's right. Since 95. So yeah, 23 years. Officially kind of got it started in about January of 95, along with Tim O'Leary, who owns the Kettle House. Okay. He and I kind of got started at the exact same time. Right on. So. Yeah. So grew up in Helena, um, went to MSU for one year in architecture, decided I probably wasn't going to become an architect, came here for business in uh, uh, 88, I think. 88. My second year, yeah. Wow. Graduated, you said, 92, 91. 91? Yeah. Okay. In business here. In the business, general business degree, specific yeah, major? Yeah, um, I had an emphasis in uh, human resource management. Okay. I don't think I actually completely understood what that meant, I think. <laughs> what does that mean? You probably have human resource management at, yeah. at the Big Dipper, I would think. Yeah, it means 
you know, dealing with employees. Dealing with employees, dealing yeah. with people. And I don't actually deal with as many employees. I kind of oversee the whole operation, but there's some managers that do more of the right. hiring and that type of thing. So, okay, so graduate in 92 and... 91. Yeah, well, it was winter 91, so I mean, geez, another few I weeks. by a couple of weeks. Right. Okay. So anyway, get out of school and what comes after that? Um, I had really had no idea what I was going to do. I was working at Goldsmiths, which was... a really cool ice cream shop on the river okay a bunch of friends all worked there um really fun job learned how to make ice cream it's a really popular place for like breakfast and lunch i worked there making ice cream i'd all i thought and i'd approach the owner about maybe expanding that business and it wasn't really in their interest at the time and so i ended up getting what i considered you know a real job with it's called prudential preferred financial services and mm. it was uh doing uh you know, selling insurance and insurance sales and that okay. kind of thing. Yeah. But when you're 20 years old, you know, you really don't have, you don't know a lot of people with insurance, life insurance needs and Yeah, because I mean, that's how you start out in that business. You got to yeah. kind of sell to your yeah. personal network. And yeah, it was really tough. And I think those companies run, it's a great way for them to make money because they don't have to pay renewals to those yeah. agents yeah. because they move on to other things. And you really, I mean, listen, in Missoula, when you're 20, all of your friends are, everyone's just skiing and biking and goofing off. No, no one really had their mind set on, you know, careers and making money. Sure. So anyway, I lasted about a um, year and a half, two years. And okay. Half. And towards the end when I realized like, oh, this is not going to be a career that's going to work for me, I started writing a business plan for Big Dipper. Mm. And I'd written a similar business plan when I took an entrepreneurship class. At U of M. So this idea was poking around. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. And so I realized, like, the only thing I know how to do is make ice cream. That's really my marketable skill. Okay. And I wanted to own my own business. I thought that would be exciting because there was a point when I was going to open a coffee shop. And I think at that time, Food for Thought opened up and Catalyst. Okay. And I thought, oh, man, market is saturated. <laughs> <laughs> it was like pre-Starbucks. Yeah, how many? Like, how many oh, coffee we can't handle. Yeah. can't handle more than two coffee shops. We've got Butterfly too. So, oh geez. So I wrote a business plan for Big Dipper, and I got that rolling. And, and so was this was this interest in ice cream just sort of accidental because you'd worked at that other shop, or, yeah, or was well, there something about ice cream in particular it was, that it drew was, it was in? accidental? But I it was I loved that job. Okay. I loved, and I got to be my own boss. We put in our own music, listen to our own music make ice cream it was fun ice cream is a happy food yeah. like everyone likes it when you serve ice cream to someone they're pretty excited about it you know um when you approach someone to buy life insurance <laughs> you know you're talking about death you know yeah, yeah, i can't think not of two so much. different products <laughs> right yeah, absolutely and uh my mom had been in food service she was a well she was a dietitian and she actually made ice cream at a hospital Okay. Years and years ago. Oh, man. And she was yeah. a f she had a cooking television show, and she was the food editor of the Spokesman Review. So I grew up in a kind of a foodie-type family, so I understood dessert, and I loved ice cream growing up. Yeah. So, um, and I saw a market for it because what was going on at Goldsmiths, they had a little bit of wholesale business and a really popular retail business. I had no plans to do a retail business because they had their thing going. My plan was manufacture ice cream, sell it to restaurants. Okay. And so that's what I started doing. Um, a friend of, a good friend of mine growing up was Tim O'Leary and Susie Rizza, his wife. Mm -hmm. And they came, they were down in Colorado and he called me up one day and said, hey, we're in town, let's grab a beer. We went down, down to Iron Horse and we're having a beer. And he's like, I'm going to start a, a U Brew mm -hmm. a brewery, which was kind of a new thing that was coming from Canada where... Um, people would come in and brew their own beer. Okay. And then you'd come back a couple weeks later. Yeah, leave it, it there and that, yeah, on the on site yeah. facility. Okay. And that was really novel. And that was something popular in Canada because the tax on beer was expensive. So, uh, way around that. And at the time, you know, we didn't have a bunch of breweries and import beers weren't as big a deal. So, anyway, so he, he had this plan. And I said, well, I have this plan to make ice cream. And so we looked for a couple months for a spot. And settled on where the cattle house is now on Myrtle. Okay, okay. It was a pottery place. It was just completely filled with dirt. Yep. 
cleaned the whole place out, put in floor drains, like the whole bit. Most of the produ- most of the man- most of the cleanup and the construction was for he him. Said, okay, so are you sort of going in joint on this this property in a way? No, like it's more his he- property. Okay, and I was helping him get it started, and then I was occupying a little corner in the back that I was. So help me get this thing off the ground. Yeah. Help me get the property sorted out. I'll let you do your ice cream thing in the corner. Right. Yeah, I'll pay right him on. some rent. That helps him. And so for the first year, you know, I had a small ice cream machine. I had a walk-in freezer, a little desk, a sink, you know, yeah, just a little yeah. tiny ice cream shop. So I made ice cream in there for about a year or so and sold it to places like Butterfly Herbs and the Good Food Store and, you know, things like that. Sure. A lot of ca- a lot of places that don't exist anymore. Cause and at this point, like... Do you know that you're good at it, or do you, or is that starting um, to? I was pretty, com- I was pretty confident that I was good at it because I was good at it at Goldsmith. And Goldsmith. how do you? I mean, what's the signal? Just that your buddies are digging it, or yeah, because um, creativity. Okay. And um, and also when you're young, I mean, you don't know that things can go wrong. You know, <laughs> like yeah, being you know, now, if I started a business today, I'd be scared to death. Sure. Because, yeah. Well, geez, I, you know, I don't want to lose my house. I got kids and family and wife and cars and but yeah, when you're consequence when you're 20 early 20s like you could just told someone the other day who's having struggles trying to start a business and he was really worried about it and just hitting some roadblocks and i was like you're 27 you could lose everything right now like everything you've ever saved up for you could lose everything and start over and it's not that big a it's deal still fine yeah i can't do that you can't do that you know we're older with families you i mean that's a scary prospect. So when you're young, it just I wasn't scared of failing. Sure. Yeah. And um, but yeah, so that's how it, that's how it started there. Uh, a year later, the opportunity came to move into the building that we're at now on okay. Fifth Higgins. So it was, and that was. Did you build that building, or was it there? No, that's been there forever. In fact, it was it was a gas station originally. It'd been a number of things, mm-hmm. and there was a catering company that was in there for two or three years and the woman was moving her business downtown and she, I was telling her, I was kind of considering doing a, a retail store. Um, a good friend of mine, Dale Bickle, who's the CAO of city of Missoula right now. He and I grew up together. Um, he went to school, business school here with, with me and he was doing my taxes and he was like, Oh, I'd really like to own a business. And we were like, well, let's start an ice cream store off of this. So, sure. so he helped my wife and I start the store. And uh, he was part of that for about uh, maybe six, six or seven years. Okay. And we bought him out. But, okay. Yeah. And so what does that thought process, process look like of, you know, you've got your, you know, your wholesale business where you're selling to butterfly herbs right. or you know, whoever. And then you think, okay, I want to sell direct to customers, open up yeah. a stand. Like, what yeah. is that? What, what made you come to that realization? Um, that there was a, that there was an opportunity that there was potential to do this. I hadn't really, it really wasn't part of the original plan, Yeah. but I think it was my friend coming to me saying, have you, you know, we should do this. And it was just, it kind of just evolved into like, oh, this could be really neat. Well, now I have it. It's no big deal. We are making ice cream. It's a good product. Now we should retail. Now that side, of, it was a lot, probably a little harder than I thought to get started. Mm-hmm. wasn't as busy as I expected it to be when we started. You didn't have a line around the block on day one no like way. you do now? No way. <laughs> yeah. And I drove home. You know, I drive home at home every day past Dairy Queen, which would just be like, you know, a thousand people. So. Sure, sure. Um, so it took t- it took time. What were some key milestones in that process? Like when you know, when did you sort of figure figure out? Okay, I got to change this, or mm-hmm. this is working. We're going to double down on this. Um, a couple of things I would say. Um, at one point, when I was able to buy our building, okay, was a huge deal because the rents were getting expensive in the neighborhood and I was really worried that we wouldn't be able to afford to stay there yeah. or something could happen. Sure, you got some, some So once we were able to, my wife and I bought that building, we felt like we had the security of like, okay, now we're, no one can take this away from us. We're yeah. here. Okay. So that was really important. Um, and once we kind of started, we started experimenting more with interesting flavors and getting more than just, I mean, we always did some different things, you know. We started working with some different chefs, and that was a big change in point two, I mm-hmm. think. But it's just, you know, it was just a slow evolution, and it took a, it took a while for it to get really popular. 
Okay. And what, what, when was that about when you felt like, wow, this thing is, there is that line around the block. And um, this is the place. Yeah. Closer to like 2005, I think. Okay. So after having. That, well, you're like eight or so eight years. Eight or years. Eight to ten years. Okay. You know, it was doing fine and it was, things were rolling along, but then it kind of just turned a corner. Yeah. Um, we did this thing. Where we have a lot of we have a lot of friends that are, that own businesses like I, you know, Bob Marshall owns Biga Pizza, uh-huh. and Jason Willenbrock owns um, Pas Chocolat. Sure. And so we had different friends that were at a bunch of different friends like Paul Meyer, who's not here anymore, but he owned uh, Five Fifteen and was a local chef. And we thought, why don't we feature chefs every month? And okay. have them come up with flavors. Yep. So we came up with these really. They came up with these really wild flavors. And we featured them, and it really took off. And so we're actually doing that again. We're bringing that back in the next couple of months. We just did one with Jason for Valentine's Day, but we just made some ice cream with uh, Bob Marshall, and we did some with Burn Street Bistro too. So, so that connection, working together with other businesses, is really fun. And then I guess in the next milestone for us, I think was when Twitter and Facebook – became popular oh interesting became, because it became a new avenue for marketing <clears throat> okay. and uh we started we'd been making cold smoke ice cream for a while uh-huh but we put it on when twitter is kind of new we put it on twitter like hey we're making cold smoke ice cream and then and the news stations were following us got and it. then they yeah. were always looking for stories and then they got on the news and it made it on to like msnbc and then to the today show needed some for something they were doing and so that was yeah, I mean, it's hard to remember the days before Twitter or Facebook. Like, how would you find out that that Big Dipper was running a Cold Smoke special? Yeah, I mean, it would it would maybe be word of mouth. Yeah, maybe we post And I, you know, ne- I've never <laughs> done a lot of. I've always done more guerrilla style marketing. Yeah, um, I've played music in bands for years. I've been in, absolutely. That's that's a big part of this story. We're gonna yeah. get into. <laughs> You're gonna get to it. <laughs> so. Um, I use some of the things that I learned from that yeah. part of okay. my life in business. So maybe we'll just go there. So you are the lead singer for VTO. Is right. The name your, what does yeah. VTO stand for? Um, it stands for Vi Thompson Overdrive. Okay. It did. Still does in a certain way, I guess. She was a TV personality in town, had this little television show. And it was just like a kind of a funny thing to name our band. And this is in 90, it's been since 92. Is the same band, same original uh, members? It's not the same original members, but all of them will be playing with us this May in wow. the Top Hat. That's awesome. So I'm friends with all of them. So this enterprise started in college, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So I always did. Part of the punk scene, is mm-hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah. I've been, always been involved with music for many years. That's how I know like a lot of friends like Kiefer Hahn. Yeah, absolutely. That. When you're in the kind of the do-it-yourself punk rock scene, yeah, you know, to put on you put on your own shows. Mm-hmm. So you you go and you rent the Union Hall, and then you go and you rent a PA system, and you Save hire a sound guy, all, yeah. and then you um, you go to Kinkos and make flyers. <laughs> you yep. make the flyers not with your computer, but you know you're cutting things out and taping things up and whatever. Yeah, you're hustling, and then you walk go all over town, all over campus. You put flyers up, and you get creative with your marketing how you get the word out and then you have show and sometimes we get what are some of the most creative things you had to do like you know you say get creative but and and gorilla what does that mean like how are you trying to drive people well you're not going to be able to afford to put an ad in the independent or Brazilian so you're using flyers or you're making handbills and you're downtown you're handing them out to people yeah you know uh, or you get on the on KUFM and there was no college radio station at the time, so KUFM. Mm-hmm. So you would do just creative different things or make stickers. And you put slap the stickers put on, on over things. everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you handed them to kids skateboarding around town. And so we would put on these shows down at the Moose Lodge in Union Hall. I mean, I put on, and I used to promote shows back then. And I put I put on Green Day in the Union Hall. Wow. I did the Offspring and what called Trends, but it's been a bunch of other things like the Palace now. Okay. Put on a ton of bands that are actually today still today really big bands but but we'd bring in bands we'd promote it and we'd let they'd stay at our house and my wife and I used to call our house the punk rock bed and breakfast <laughs> we'd have all these bands that stay at our house and feed them breakfast the next day and that you're working on zero budget 
nobody has any money, you know. Yep. And but we're putting on these shows, and you're and you're taking money at the door, and you're paying the bands, you're paying all the sound you're people, doing all the functions, and that's you know besides getting a degree and learning business, that was a really practical business experience. Right. And so you take that exact thing. And you, now you have Big Dipper ice cream. It's like, geez, I don't have $300 to put an ad in the Missoula. And so mm-hmm. how do you get the word out there? So you just do similar things. Or yeah. ha- One time, uh, Leif from Le Petit got a screen printing press. Okay. And we made um, Big Dipper, uh, sorry, yeah, Big Dipper ice cream shirts with our logo. Sure. And I got a whole bunch of really cheap, like, Hanes white t-shirts screened a whole bunch of he screened a whole bunch of big dipper shirts and then we just gave them to everybody yep get the word out so we're giving out t-shirts so it's the same mentality that i had from the do-it-yourself you know punk rock scene Mm -hmm. for big dipper and so to this day it's still that's the fun part in marketing is what can you do that's a little different without because you could spend so much money on you know Television, radio, and oh, print. Yeah. And All those we don't do channels. a lot of those things. It doesn't work for us necessarily. Mm-hmm. Sometimes maybe just the line in front of Big Dipper is enough advertising. Yeah, that's a lot of advertising. Yeah. Yeah. And along those lines, I mean, and you're to the point now, and I don't know quite when this started. We'll maybe get into it. But your commitment to this community just... It just you exude it. I mean, you're all these connections and, and, yeah. and all these other business owners that you are networked with, mm-hmm. um, but from a place of community, not yeah. from a place of sort of trying to profit off of the people. Here. Right. It's it's everything. I think. Um, well, what, I grew up in a. My mom was. Uh, she was uh, in city politics. She's a city council person in Helena, but she volunteered. She volunteered yeah. for everything. She's helped start the the the. Helena Food Bank, I think it's called the Food Share. She was on the steering committee for that. She volunteered for church stuff. She volunteered at elections. She did all that. And growing up, she really stressed the importance of volunteering. So um, I've always, for a long time, been involved with volunteering and uh, being involved with different things like the Downtown Association. I'm on the BID board and just Uh making those connections and that, you know, just because for lots of reasons. It's the right thing to do, but it's fun. You meet a lot of people. And then ultimately it comes back to you because it helps your business. Sure, sure. Involved in a ton of events around town as well. Yeah, uh, yeah well, we 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 sponsor a lot of events. Yeah. So, and yeah. because so you you know, we're we've been I've been involved in music and I've always loved running mm-hmm. a lot, as you know, and, and cycling. So those 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 are the things that we've really done a lot with. We have a right now we have a women's trail running team that we sponsor. Yeah, how did that come about? <laughs> um, M Kendrick came to me. I, she worked at Runners Edge. Great gal, uh, good great runner, and she had this idea to do it. They they these ladies love Big Dipper, and they and they knew that I love running and trail running, so. They started, they started this trail running. Sounds like an easy sale. Yeah. <laughs> and from that, it splintered off into there's a little dipper um, running team. Do you know about that? Is that with it's the like, kids? Yeah, it's the kids. Yeah, and it seems like it might be expanding a little bit this year. That's fantastic. Yeah, I don't have as much to do with it. It's more, you know, just Well, but you've created this platform yep. where, you know, others can yep. now sort of grow that community as yeah. well. But, yeah, just it's just really been fun to be involved in it. And, you know, if I'm not... Maybe I don't have time to be racing bikes anymore, or running as much, but you can still be involved by, you know, you, I've sponsored some runners. Or, right, right. You know, be, we work pretty closely with Runner's Edge and uh-huh. we donate ice cream to all their races. So those types of partnerships are exciting. And it's going to feel good. I mean, you just add... You just add happiness yeah. when you, you come in. Yeah, and, you know, we, we get we do get hit up for, you know, everything, everybody sure. and everything. But we try to do as much as we can. It might not always be a lot, but do something, and it just keeps your name out in the community. Yeah, what are your – I mean, yeah, you said you get asked to do everything, um, and for good reason. So yeah. what are some of your, like, guiding principles with regard to what you say yes to first and what you maybe uh, – First yes would be – Things that either myself, my wife, or my employees are involved in. So I re- try to be as supportive. If some of my employees are, you know, in a play mm. or they're on a swim team or something like that, you know, and 
those organizations need something, we'll help that way. Sure, so keep it in through the friends, like, yeah. yeah, we just did. We're going to be doing something with Max Swim Team. Oh, great! Because uh, J- a good friend, Jed Dennison's involved with that. So yeah. things, you know, that my friends are involved with. Mm-hmm. First and foremost. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Again, supporting you know your your yeah. community, your network. Yeah. And so. You know, as the, as the operation's grown, as Big Dipper's grown and been successful, and now you've opened, is it two more locations? you got yeah. a Helena shop and a, and a billing shop. Yeah, the Helena shop's a franchise that uh, Anna Doran uh, used to run for University of Montana, okay. started. Um, I helped her, and uh, she recently just sold it to her manager, but I think she's going to, Anna's going to stay on, be helping us do some other things. Okay. But uh, that's going great over there, and then... Uh, my manager, Brian, and I started a store over in Billings, and Leah, who was our truck manager, she also ha- owns a small percentage of that as well. So really? So that's what's going on over there. And so what was the kind of thinking with those? How did you know you were ready to expand the, the Big Dipper footprint? Wasn't Well, I wasn't planning on it. Anna came to me for the Helena when I grew up in Helena, so she just pestered me to do that. And I said, all right, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. It'll be fun. So it's turned out great. Uh, the Billings, one was my manager who, he also owns uh, p- half of the Big Dipper mobile business. So we have a side business, which is our ice cream truck business. Okay. Which also does all the vending at the university and uh-huh. places like that. And uh, I think he just needed more ownership in something, you know, some equity and something. And this seemed, and his in-laws were from Billings. We thought this would be a great opportunity over there. Uh, a guy by the name, Jeremiah, who owns the building, his family owns the building that we're in in Billings, approached us. And uh, he, uh, he kind of bugged us about putting a Big Dipper in there. He'd kind of gotten wind that maybe we were thinking about doing a billing, Big Dipper in Billings. So, and he had the perfect spot. So it's turned out great. Nice. And are those as busy in the summertime? As- uh, not as busy as Missoula. Um, Helena is getting busier and busier, and Billings is starting to get busier. Yeah. Billings is a different, you know, it's just a different kind of town. Different spot. Yeah, but yeah. it's good. And so as you're looking as you're looking ahead, so what is, I mean, how do you define success in your in your business with the um, people having free time? Okay, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't get into owning my own business, so I have to work 60, 70 hours a week. I've done that, Uh but it's not why I started it. And I know business owners do that where they work just so much. But we live in Missoula, and just like I know you know, it's like we want to be running, biking, skiing, hanging out with our kids, and um, so being outside. So, So the motivation is to, you know, not work too much. I like that, to not work too much. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so it, um, so I'd assume you have like some notion of what is the appropriate amount of growth mm-hmm. or, or, or just the appropriate sort of steady state for the business. Do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, I work, I just, there, it's gone in a lot of different directions. Yeah. So I'm concerned that it gets like too complicated of a business. Sure. So I'm not sure where it goes from there. And there's always, you know, talk of like, oh, well, maybe we should do Bozeman. Maybe we should do Whitefish or Kalispell or Great Falls. So well, we have an entire system that's based on growth, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the assumption that, that yeah. and, and it's more than the assumption. Like if uh, you see it, like in a lot of businesses, if they don't grow, they are in huge trouble. Right. Like the whole model's built around. I this. think what's different for us is it's solely owned by my wife and I. Yeah. Yeah. That gives and you a lot I have friends that own a business where there's investors mm-hmm. and they're saying, Hey, you, you know, you need, you need to keep opening stores. Yeah. You got to deliver. Yeah. So we need, we, you know, we need returns on this investment. We, we think you need to open a store here. You need to open a store there. Yeah. And so that's what they're doing and they're doing it. Okay. But it seems stressful. And I, it's nice that we can, we've always grown at a really slow pace. And has that, I mean, when you say it's its own solely by you and your wife, is that, was that a, like a, a, a non-negotiable sort of foundation from the start, like we will not take on debt, we will not sell off equity. No, we haven't really talked about. It. She's not in. She's she's an owner by name, just that, by sure. the fact that we're married. Um, but 
she's not really involved the day to day of the business anymore. She has been in the past, uh-huh. but, um, so it's kind of my deal, and we're just happy with the the way it's going right now. Yeah. You never know; it'll change. That's true. <laughs> I mean, what are the uh, if anything? I mean, yeah. If things did keep you up at night about the business, what would they be? What are the the sort of things that might scare you? Oh. You worry about losing key employees mm. that are you really count on because you know we've delegated a lot of the day to day to people. So when you have someone that leaves for another job or someone getting hurt or those types of things would, are the types of things that probably worry me the most. Sure. And what do you think is next for Big Dipper? Um, well, we are getting a ice cream bike built. It's almost done. By Coaster Pedicabs. Do you know those guys? No, I don't. Tell me about it. It's them. a fascinating business. It's really cool. You should look, if you look it up. Coaster Pedicabs. Yeah, so out in Bonner, there's a business that moved from, I believe, back east. And they employ, I think they have about 15 full time employees. And it's really fascinating. They make pedicabs, so bikes that pull sure. little cabs. And they sell those all over the country. They use them at festivals and uh-huh. in big cities, and they sell advertising on the back of them. And they wanted to get into doing an ice cream bike. They've also made bikes for Starbucks recently. Okay. And uh, making bikes for UPS for delivery in cities. In tight areas, yeah. yeah. And they're making the, all this, like they're welding everything. I mean, they're building everything right, right there. Right out in Bonner. Yeah, it's it's really a fascinating business. And they and they wanted to do an ice cream bike. So that's it's almost done. So we're going to have a bike that will that we can drive around and... It'll be kind of a companion piece to our ice cream truck. And so we can use it at the football games and maybe on camps a little bit selling. We'll do some pre-packaged little containers of ice cream. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And how about on the running space? You said you had this knee surgery a mm-hmm. year or so ago. Is that right? Uh, yep. Or, just yeah, about a year. And starting to feel better. And Yeah. Finally can run again a little bit. It's got to make you feel better. Yeah. It's hard. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I do a lot of my, I mean, I've often said that my dissertation was largely written on the run in the sense that a lot of my best, I say best, that doesn't mean they're good, but my best ideas came out on long runs or long bike rides. Yeah, is, is you know, that, I was just talking to our friend, our mutual friend, Kiefer, yeah. Ron, about that today, this morning, how, you know, you go on a run and... The wheels are turning in my head and yeah. all the best ideas I've ever had have come out of a run and you get back and you're just like, I figured it out. You know, I've got, it's just like, ding. Mm-hmm. And that's for me running. I've just, I've been a runner since I was in fifth grade for right. a long time. And uh, I, I love it. So when I couldn't run because of my knee, it was pretty frustrating. It's stifling. Uh, so I'm not a musician at all. I mean, I love music, but I can't play or sing mm-hmm. for a lick. Does that kind of creative juices flowing approach that you experience with running in your business, does that all apply to to running in your music? Yeah, I think it's all interconnected. I mean, running doesn't have the creative side of it. I guess for the music side of things, it's just that creativity and the the idea of doing something that's a little different than not everybody else is doing. I, I like that aspect of it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's good to know you're running again. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> hopefully, if my knee cooperates, we can share we'll the trail. We'll go running together summer. one of these days. I'd love it. That'd be good. Charlie, this was great. I mean, I love your business. Uh, I love your dedication to the community and sort of the thoughtfulness with which you've carved out balance in your life. And yeah. thanks for coming on the podcast yeah, and telling thanks, your story. Jason. Appreciate it. All right. Until next time. Thanks. All right, super fun conversation with Charlie. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and uh, get yourself over to the Big Dipper, grab some ice cream as soon as you can. So coming up next week, we've got Aaron Switalski. Aaron Switalski is the executive director of Women's Voices for the Earth. Women's Voices for the Earth is a really important organization and you should know about the important work they're doing. They're headquartered here in Missoula, but this is a nationwide organization. They're doing important work all across the country. They've done amazing things like gotten Procter and Gamble to the negotiating table, changed policy, changed law in Washington. Just an amazing organization doing important work. The organization is all about removing harmful chemicals from products, particularly products that in, that women disproportionately interact with. 
So it was fun to learn about their work and inspiring to learn about all the, the incredible things Aaron's involved in. So stay tuned for next week. Remember that A New Angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale supply companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business -business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in our community, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out www.cedcareers.com. Moving forward, if you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. First, please rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the podcast. Second, write a review. The more reviews we get, and hopefully positive ones, the more we can grow. And third, please just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can also support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash a new angle. There you will also find a link to donate to the pod. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few folks for making this podcast happen. First off, great thanks to Elizabeth Willie, Communications Director at the University of Montana College of Business. And thanks to our fabulous interns, Savannah Sletton and Max Gibson. I'd also like to give a special shout out to VTO for providing us with music. And finally, thanks to my producer, Stefan Borsum. As we close, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks and see you next time.